How do you know you're on the right path? Do you catch yourself thinking, what if I'm actually not where God wants me to be and I'm just doing my own thing? What if it may be too late when I realize it tomorrow? One of our greatest fears is discovering in the end that we did everything for nothing and all our sacrifices and labor were misplaced. However, the child of God has the blessed hope that even when we don't know where we are or can't fully explain how our life is at the moment, we can be sure that we will know whether we are on the right path or not. As a child of God, you don't have to fear because the Spirit of God lives in you, and He will always tell you when something is right or when you are taking a wrong turn. This is the promise from the mouth of the Lord Himself to His people. And you can be certain that because you are one of His children, you won't be an exception. Isaiah 30, 21 Whether you turn to the right or to the left, your ears will hear a voice behind you saying, This is the way. Walk in it. As you make your journey through life, God will use different methods to tell you that you are on the right path. When you get God's confirmation, regardless of how you feel or the things you may be seeing, keep going. You will end well. Before I share some signs that God uses to say you're on the right path, I want you to know that before you can say if you're on the right path or the wrong path, you need to know the destination you are headed to and if the direction you're taking leads you there. I usually use this illustration when sharing about life choices. If I need to travel to a state in the eastern part of my country, I don't have any business taking a vehicle going to a northern, western, or southern state. If while I'm in the vehicle heading east, and the driver takes a turn and starts heading south, I'd be concerned. I would ask what the problem was and, if needed, get out of the vehicle. Why? Because I know my destination. and. Though I may not know all the roads in between, at least I can tell that taking a route in the wrong direction would not get me there. If I were using a GPS, it would tell me when I'm going off course and how to get back on track. Similarly, as you journey through this world, there will be diversions and distractions that may take you temporarily off the path God laid out for you. The enemy aims to use these derailings to sidetrack many saints and lead them down a path of destruction. Hence, the fear among many and the question, are we on the right path? Now here are some signs that God will send you to tell you that you are on the right path and that you should stay on it. Number one, it is a sign you are on the right path when God is confirming your destiny by speaking to you about where you are and your next step. What does this mean? Do you remember Joshua in the Bible, Moses' servant who would later lead the Israelites into the Promised Land after Moses' death? Well, after Joshua was ordained to lead the people, he must have been overwhelmed with fear and uncertainty. Maybe he even felt lost. However, God came and spoke to him about his destiny. God told him what he needed to do right then and that was to be strong and courageous. He assured Joshua of his presence with him to support him anywhere he went. If you are on a path where you cannot find any divine confirmation and assurance, either through peace in your heart or a word from God, then you may not be on the right path. But if you sense an overwhelming peace that keeps you going despite how hard the road seems or if you keep hearing God telling you about your next course of action, then you're on the right path. Remember that he said he will tell you when to turn left or when to turn right. Number two, another sign that God is saying you're on the right path is that you're getting to the results that lead you towards what God has spoken of for your life without compromising anything. Results can be quite deceptive. Hence, you have to know how to tell between God-approved results and those that aren't. Sometimes prosperity is not a mark of God's presence. Even the devil can make someone prosper as long as that prosperity leads them further and further away from God. You can use success or prosperity to mark that you are doing things right. 
people bow to the devil, steal, lie, cheat, and even kill to make millions or succeed in life, their results don't mean they're on the right path. During the temptation in the wilderness, the devil told Jesus that if he only bowed to him, he would give him all the riches and power in this world. However, the sign of a right path with God is that the results you are getting lead you towards those things God has spoken of for your life, and they are not the product of any compromise. This means that whatever results you are getting align with and are supported by what God's Word says about holiness and legitimate work. It means that you aren't cutting corners to get what you want. It means that the results you are getting are glorifying the Lord and leading you further towards fulfilling your God-ordained destiny. This process may be long and uncomfortable, but it is God's way. Stay on it, stick to it, and trust God with it. The road may be bumpy, but you know it will always lead to your destination. Remember that if you really need to get to a place, you won't let the bumpy ride keep you from getting there. You will bear with the road because you know each minute brings you closer and closer to your destination. Number three, God is saying you are on the right path if the things you are seeking are eternally motivated, even if they are earthly possessions. The Bible has made it clear that we were created to ultimately glorify God, love Him, and fulfill His purposes on earth. I believe that at the center of all our different visions, purposes, and callings, God's bigger picture is that we love Him, serve Him, and love others around us. Jesus established this when He was approached by the rich young man who wanted to know the secret to perfectly walk with God. Jesus told him to obey the commandments, and when he said he had obeyed all from childhood, Jesus told him what he needed to do. Matthew 19, verse 21. Jesus answered, If you want to be perfect, go sell your possessions and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. Of course, the young man turned and left Jesus because he couldn't see himself apart from his possessions. You see, a sign that you are on the right path is that you are not attached to the things you have been given. When you consider yourself a manager and God is the true owner of all you have, when your heart's desire is to gather all you can so that you can serve God's purposes with it, you are on the right path. For example, a man wants to be the greatest surgeon in the world, not because he wants to be famous, but because he wants to help as many people as possible. When he sees himself as God's ambassador in the medical field, to treat and bring healing to people and to extend God's love and deliverance, he is serving God's purpose. Remember, this applies to each of us as ambassadors of the Great Commission in Mark 16, 15 through 18. He said to them, Go into the world and preach the gospel to all creation. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. And these signs will accompany those who believe. In my name they will drive out demons, they will speak in new tongues, they will pick up snakes with their hands, and when they drink deadly poison, it will not hurt them at all. They will place their hands on sick people and they will get well. God sees the heart, and you cannot fake these things. He will know whether you are genuinely seeking eternal or earthly gains by how attached and unyielding you are with the things of this world. Such attachments will make it difficult for you to keep in step with God. There would always be a conflict of loyalty if you are torn between God and your possessions. If you continue to follow the dictates of your desires rather than of God's glory, you are walking outside the right path and it will lead to destruction. The point is that your earthly decisions and your callings will change and evolve over time. Your path may be different from mine and mine from yours when we look at them from a physical perspective. However, as a child of God, you must know that from a biblical perspective, Everything we are and everything we will ever have 
must always be for the same purpose, and that is to glorify God. Through our love of God and our desire to serve His purpose, as well as our love for other people, we can know that we are on the right path. These signs exist to bring you hope and comfort in all things. In the day of uncertainty, you can hear as God uses them to say the same words Jesus told His disciples as He ascended to heaven. Behold, I am with you unto the end of ages. Keep walking in God's path. Your destiny is bright and victory is guaranteed. What happens when your life seems isolated from everyone else? When it seems like whatever you do, no matter how much you try or how well-meaning your heart is, you just seem to be too different, unfit, and sometimes even unwanted. This message is God's word to you. There is a big reason God is allowing you to go through isolation from the rest of the world. You need to discover the beauty in being set apart. Lately, I have been looking a lot at the Old Testament, and the more I studied it, the more I understood why the New Testament is not complete without the Old. The Old Testament points us to the New, and the New Testament fulfills everything the Old revealed in a practical way. I got to see that when God begins to restore and heal His people, He referenced the fact that they may have experienced isolation before. Isaiah chapter 60 verse 15 is a good example. Although you have been forsaken and hated, with no one traveling through, I will make you the everlasting pride and the joy of all generations. Of course, in this case in Isaiah, the people of God had been isolated because of their disobedience to God. But now their isolation was changing because God was restoring them. However, we can see that somehow, even in isolation, God still watches over His people. This must give us an idea that, although we do not encourage believers to drive themselves into isolation because that may be dangerous to their faith and survival, there exists a possibility that God Himself can choose to separate you from everything around you to perfect you in areas you never imagined. Now, there are different kinds of separation. There is a separation that is done by yourself under the influence of your personal desires and fleshly interests, which isn't about God or His will. Proverbs chapter 18, verse 1 gives us an idea about this. It says, He who willfully separates himself from God and man seeks his own desire. He quarrels against all sound wisdom. There is vast difference between when you isolate yourself and when God isolates you. You see, when the devil wants to destroy a believer, he first convinces the believer to separate themselves from other believers. The person will stop going to church fellowships and start avoiding contact with other believers. And even when they meet other Christians, they avoid giving anything away. They don't want anyone to be part of their lives. There may be many excuses for doing this on the surface, but the truth is that they are under an attack, an attack that is making them crave life outside the faith circle. Hence, the Bible says in Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verses 9 through 12, two are better than one because they have a good return for their labor. If either of them falls down, one can help the other up. But pity anyone who falls and has no one to help them up. Also, if two lie down together, they will keep warm. But how can one keep warm alone? Though one may be overpowered, two can defend themselves. A cord of three strands is not quickly broken. And Hebrews chapter 10 verse 25 adds, Not forsaking our meeting together as believers for worship and instruction, as is the habit of some but encouraging one another, and all the more faithfully as you see the day of Christ's return approaching. Now, this does not have to do only with the physical church fellowship, but also the general sense of commitment to God's kingdom in relationships, service, and devotion. Whatever does not draw you closer to God seeks to destroy your life, whether it's an offense, a hurt, a job, fame, an open door, a relationship, or anything else. However, when God separates you and it seems like you are alone because of what He is doing in your life, 
then you are in for a wonderful adventure where your life is going to come out on the other side looking more beautiful. You see, while reading through the Old Testament and into the New, I learned that some of the greatest examples of men and women mightily used in their generations were frequently set apart by God for Himself before being revealed to the people to bless them. One reason being set apart and isolated by God is something you should crave is because it will help you see the world from a different perspective. There are things you may never see or understand as long as you are running with the crowd. As long as you stand within the chaos of the crowd, you're only going to be limited to what the crowd sees and feels. But when you are apart from them, you will see what they aren't seeing and feel what they cannot feel. For example, in order for God to make Abraham a blessing to the world to this day, God had to separate him from all he'd ever known, his home, childhood friends, family tradition, and even family relationships. Genesis chapter 12 verses one through three says, the Lord has said to Abram, go from your country, your people and your father's household to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation and I will bless you. I will make your name great and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. Abraham was from a land of idol worshipers, but God was going to not only deliver him from that life, but he was also going to give him a brand new life. And in order for this to happen, he took him out from the environment he was used to. Sometimes your life may feel like it's not making any progress. You check your relationship with God and everything seems fine. You study your Bible, pray, walk in obedience to the best of your knowledge, but it still seems you are not fitting in like you wish you could. This is a confirmation from God to you today. God is still with you. He hasn't abandoned you. He hasn't gone on leave. You're going through a strengthening process. Like gold going through the refiner's fire, you are on your way to a greater beauty than you've ever known. Understanding God's big reason for isolating you will help you embrace it with trust in Him without complaining. Abraham was not the only person God separated from his family. What about Jacob, who at the time seemed to be running from his brother Esau, but in truth was running into God's plan for his life? What about Moses, who seemed to have lost his way and was exiled from his esteemed position of honor in Egypt? How could someone fall from a high prince to an ordinary shepherd? Yet, he was where God wanted him to be. The years he spent as a shepherd were God teaching him to become a faithful shepherd to his people. What about David, Elijah, even the Lord Jesus himself or the great apostle Paul? Each of these people are perfect examples given to us from the Bible so that we can see and understand the beauty of being separated for God. You see, being separated for God may seem like a lonely road and it may place many restrictions on you, probably affecting your social life and relationship opportunities. However, its aim is to serve something deeper than anything this world can offer. For example, when Jesus was going to name his 12 disciples to whom he would entrust the ministry of the kingdom, here was what he did. Mark chapter three, verses 13 through 15. Jesus went up on a mountainside and called to him those he wanted, and they came to him. He appointed 12 that they might be with him and that he might send them out to preach and to have authority to drive out demons. Please, observe the progression. First, Jesus himself climbed up a mountainside. He went outside of the norm and climbed higher. Then he called those he wanted, and they came to him. Understand this as we ponder those words for a moment. When God calls you away from the crowd, he doesn't call you to shame you, hurt you, or destroy you. Yes, it might hurt to climb up the mountainside. It may be a rough road maintaining the standards of his calling upon your life. It may cost you things. When you look at the end, you will see and understand that his plans were for good and that it was better that those things were left behind. You can see that he wasn't calling them to waste their time, but to make them into something special, apostles, leaders, men of authority. Hold on for a second. But these were ordinary men, fishermen, zealots, 
tax collectors, liars, and cheaters. Yet, he was separating them to make them something better than they were. Isn't it amazing? But all of these could only happen on the mountainside, not among the crowd. If they hadn't accepted to go up to him, they would have remained the same. The ground may be comfortable, my friend, but you will never know and experience the beauty of the mountaintop as long as you remain at the foot of the hill. These 20 ordinary men would become empowered to cast out devils and have authority over devils and demons. Peter would grow so that his shadow would heal the sick and a brief sermon would convert thousands of souls in one event. These are not results that human intelligence can produce. They are simply the beauty of being set apart and perfected by the God who is able to make something out of nothing, somebody out of nobody. And today, He is sending you these words. Embrace the set-apart life. You are not like everyone. You have a destiny, a calling, and a life that is different but designed for the glory of God. It may not be the most comfortable life, but if God is behind it, it will become the most beautiful. Commit yourself and endure whatever process He may be taking you through. Habits will break, fears will be starved, and your true inner treasure will manifest. Why? Because God isolated you to purge and beautify your life. God has the final say over your life. You don't own yourself. No one else has the power to declare your conclusion yet. Regardless of where you are right now, until God says it's over, it isn't. You need to know that God's hand is over your life and He's in control. It's not over until God says it is. One of the greatest opponents you'll face in life is your fear of not meeting the expectations set for you. In the effort to satisfy everyone's expectations, many people will lose themselves, forgetting who they are or what they once stood for. The need to make everyone else proud has led to more broken people than fulfilled ones. Why? Many of us are taught to believe that we are who everyone else sees us to be. We are taught to believe that all you possess is the measure of your worth. But Jesus taught otherwise. Luke 12, 15. Then he said to them, Watch out, be on your guard against all kinds of greed. Life does not consist in an abundance of possessions. What is man? What is his destiny? How do you measure his worth? When God made Adam, God blessed him to be fruitful, multiply, replenish the earth, and have dominion over all living things on earth. Mankind was made as God's representative on earth. Mankind was made an authority on earth after God. The only authority over mankind was God, and God made them aware of that. How does this apply to you today? Well, you can see that from the very beginning, God's intention was clear. You were created to demonstrate fruitfulness, dominion, productivity, and life. People's lives were meant to be miracles every day. We were created to create, recreate, and maximize all God's creation to its fullest potential. Even when mankind fell from grace, God never gave up on humanity. He continued to put everything in place to make sure mankind is able to take their place in God's ultimate agenda, to be His extension on earth, demonstrating His glory until the end. King David observed God's passion for humanity when they were all sinners and kept displeasing Him, and he said, Psalm 8, 3-8 When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars, which you have set in place, what is mankind that you are mindful of them, human beings that you care for them? You have made them a little lower than the angels and crowned them with glory and honor. You made them rulers over the works of your hands. You put everything under their feet, all flocks and herds and animals of the wild, the birds in the sky, the fish in the sea, all that swim the paths of the seas, you see, God is passionate about humans, in spite of their flaws and the states of their hearts. He knows, at the end of the day, that they are the way they are because of their humanity and mankind's fall from grace. God knows that through His passionate pursuit of mankind, He provides a way for mankind to be better 
and be restored to who God designed them to be. Now, when Jesus came, he paved a way for us to get back into God's agenda. It doesn't matter where you've been, what you've been through, or what you have or don't have. If you embrace Jesus and surrender your life to him in faith, he will take control. When God is in control of your life, everything will begin to come into perspective. You will then understand what Jesus meant when he said that a person's life doesn't consist in an abundance of possessions. You may gather as many possessions as you like and think you'll find your worth in them, but you'd be surprised that you'll still feel out of place. Why? Because the most important piece is missing. Your life isn't handed over to the one who matters. You see, there's something about a life in God's control. Please note this, that God's in control doesn't mean there won't be a storm. You may lose the job. It doesn't mean God's not in control. That loved one whom you've been praying for may pass on to be with Jesus. It does not mean that God's not in control. You may pray and fast to recover from an illness, but you still don't. But whether things are or aren't working, is not an indicator if God is or isn't in control. God's dominion is first established in your heart, and therein lies the element of the assurance of faith. This assurance is that no matter what does or doesn't happen, there is a throne for God in my heart, and that throne is occupied by its rightful owner. Things may not go as I want. Things may not be as I want right now. But with Him, I know we're headed somewhere good. Do you realize that many children of God have more confidence in their pilot or driver than in God? They sleep on the plane or stare at their phone in the car, but they trust that they'll get to their destination. They don't stop after every mile and ask the driver where they're going. They don't pause to ask him if he's sure he can take them there. They just believe that he can take them where they need to be. Even when they move from one house to another, they hire movers and leave them to handle their possessions without worrying whether they'd rob them or lose their property. We all demonstrate different kinds of faith every day in different engagements. However, when it comes to God, we want to see where He's taken us and how we'll get there. The fear of failure keeps many of us from waiting faithfully to see God act in our lives. The reminder that God's in control is more than an assurance to keep you going. It's a reminder to stay within the borders of his leadership. Follow him and not yourself. Now, you may be listening to this message and think, but I haven't reached my full potential yet. Everything I tried is yet to pay off. My efforts keep meeting a brick wall. I thought that by now I'd be married. I'd have kids. I'd have my own home or my own company. You may feel like your time has passed. You may feel like it's all over. The devil may tell you that you're not enough or it's over for you because according to your understanding, you may never have the opportunity again. But remember what I said earlier? You were created to be something. God's representation on earth, fruitful and increasing. You can put expectations on yourself. People may put expectations on you, but only one expectation matters and every other expectation must be under it. It's the agenda and expectation of God for you. When you're safe within the boundary of God's agenda for you, you can safely say that He's in control of your life. At that point, no matter what happens to you, you have a strong confidence and assurance that it'll turn out well. Romans 8.18 boldly affirms this by saying, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. What you're facing today is not a representation of your destination. It's a turn in the road, a bump, a phase. It isn't the end. One day, you're going to look back and testify to God's faithfulness. Where you are right now is the least place you can be. It may not be as flashy as you dreamt it would be. It may not even be like you saw or like God said but make sure you are within the borders of His dominion. How? Through faith, in a relationship with Him. That is the place of safety, peace, and rest. It may not be the absence of trouble and chaos, but it will be the presence of peace in spite of the chaos. 
It will be the presence of hope and hopelessness and quietness in the middle of the storm. Later in verse 28 of Romans 8, the Bible adds, And we know with great confidence that God, who is deeply concerned about us, causes all things to work together as a plan for good for those who love God, to those who are called according to His plan and purpose. If God is in control of your life, His hand will rest on all your affairs. He will guide you, teach you, comfort you, and strengthen you where and when you need it. It will be easier to be led when you can obey. It'll be easier to obey when you've surrendered. Hence the question is not, will God confirm what he says in my life? Rather it is, have I given him control over my life so that he has the final word? When God's in control of your life, he will have the final say, not what people say, not how you feel, not what your circumstances say, but what he says will happen. If he has said anything about your life, stand firm in it. Stand strong in your faith. Let him lead you. Make sure he's in control of your life. As long as he's in control, nothing in your life will fall to pieces. He will keep you and you will end in blessing and rest. Let these words in 1 Peter 5.10 strengthen your assurance in God's power over your life. After you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace, who imparts His blessing and favor, who called you to His own eternal glory in Christ, will Himself complete, confirm, strengthen, and establish you, making you what you ought to be. Rejoice, because you have the Waymaker with you. Everything will be fine because your heavenly father has the final say and until he says it's over Your life is not over yet What is the benefit of pain? Does God derive pleasure from seeing you go through pain and suffering? Not at all Yet even if life takes us through painful events God has promised to make something beautiful out of your pain Rick Warren once said your greatest ministry will most likely come out of your greatest hurt. This statement captures the entire idea of how life can change once our perspectives change. When you understand that God will always use your pain to prepare you for greater things, you will trust Him even when you have every reason to cry out in frustration. One common debate I find unreasonable, especially among believers, is if God is responsible for painful situations or if he only allows good situations and something is wrong when we go through a difficult time. Well, there are many explanations for both. However, after personal time pondering on the subject, I concluded that whether God is behind my pain or not, I won't worry over it. I would rather choose to trust in his love for me and believe that whether I go through fire or through high water, I will overcome them. I learned this by observing the lives of the four Hebrew boys who were captives in Egypt, Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. For one, these boys, among many other Israelites, had been taken from their homes and from their lands. Their cities had been destroyed and their loved ones were probably dead. As if this was not painful enough, they were separated from other family members to be recruited into the king's service. They would have to look at the face of the man who took their homes and families away from them and serve him every day. Reading the first few chapters of the book of Daniel, we can notice their devotion to God. Though we can't tell what they felt, we can tell what they believed. They still believed in living for God no matter where life took them. Don't forget, they were captives because God was punishing the entire nation for idolatry. I want you to note that during God's judgment of Israel by captivity, some of the people who were taken captive or killed by the invading nations probably didn't worship any idol. Daniel and his friends were probably some such people. Here they were in captivity, but that didn't matter to them. They kept their eyes on their God being willing to trust his faithfulness as they devoted themselves to him. We saw from the beginning how God started showing up for them and confirming their trust. 
Daniel 1, verse 17. To these four young men, God gave knowledge and understanding for all kinds of literature and learning. And Daniel could understand visions and dreams of all kinds. This was after these young men asked to be exempted from the king's dishes, which included foods that were customarily forbidden from the Israelites, according to the law of Moses. Don't forget, they were in captivity, but in that captivity, they were becoming greater than they were before it. God was using their current situation to break limits in their lives and open them up to new possibilities. If you read further, you can see how these young men were willing to trust God, even when their lives were on the line. I love how they answered the king when he threatened to burn them if they didn't bow down to his golden statue. These guys had been faithful and excellent officials, and they had brought nothing but profit to the king. However, when they were put in an impossible situation where they had to choose between their devotion to God and their life, they chose their devotion. Daniel 3, 16 through 18 says, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to him, King Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to deliver us from it, and he will deliver us from your majesty's hand. But even if he does not, we want you to know, your majesty, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold you have set up. Can you see their resolve? Have you ever been burned by something hot or mistakenly put your hand into a fire? I have, and oh boy, is it painful. Whatever pain you feel when you place your hand in a fire is nothing compared to being thrown into a fiery furnace that had been heated seven times hotter than usual. Yet, as they stared at the flames and possibly at their deaths, these young men remained unshaken. They trusted in God's flawless plans for their lives. They trusted in God's sovereignty over life and death. They believed that God would save them, and if he chose not to, that would not change their devotion to him. When you read the story further, you can see that they were thrown into the flames but came out unscathed. Whatever your own path is, I want you to know that God can and will use that pain to prepare you for greater things. And guess what? After their miraculous deliverance from the fire, these young men were promoted. Not only were they promoted, the king issued a decree that recognized their faith in the whole kingdom of Babylon. Listen, that you are going through a hard time does not mean that God has left you. Just because all you've come to know and gotten used to is pain upon pain does not mean that God does not have a plan for your life. It is time to change perspectives. Take your eyes off of the pain and focus on the plan. You may not know the details of the plan, but if you know the planner, you can rest assured that it will turn out well. What makes a man a soldier? Do you become a soldier because you identify as one? Does a man become a soldier because that has always been his fantasy, and he goes to a store to buy uniforms or guns used by soldiers? None of these makes a man a soldier. A man is made a soldier when he goes through the process that makes soldiers. This process breaks and reshapes him completely. His mind and body change, and he becomes a soldier. He leaves everything behind. He loses things so that he can gain something greater. The honor of representing and protecting his nation and everyone he cares about. But the process is never easy. His trainers don't go easy on him. The drills are tough. The days and nights are long. Soldiers are subjected to some of the worst conditions possible. Is it to kill them? No. Instead, it's to awaken something greater in them. By the time they're done, a soldier can face anyone and anything. He becomes more than the man he was when he first got there. And that change will stay with him for life. Dear child of God, God can do all things, and there is no impossibility with him. However, there are a few things he cannot do. One of them is he cannot lie. When God speaks, he is bound to do it. When he speaks, his words are absolute and true. When he speaks, he backs up his words with his integrity. Today, I am reminding you 
that although you do not see or understand it right now, this pain in your life is being used to prepare you for greater things. Is your relationship going through a hard time? Are you having to deal with a difficult workplace, boss, academic journey, or anything else? God sees your tears, and as much as He wants to see you happy, He sees the bigger picture. This is a journey, and you are going through a phase. And if everything has a beginning, then surely there is an end. The Bible says in Proverbs 23, 18, There is surely a future hope for you, and your hope will not be cut off. Surely there is an end, a future for you, my friend. Keep that expectation, that dream, and that hope in your heart alive. Don't let it die. Don't lose faith. You don't get to the top from the top. You don't climb a mountain from the summit. You start from the bottom. While at the bottom, climbing the mountain may seem impossible, but each climb draws you closer to the top, whether you know it or not. David wrote in Psalm 66, verse 12, You let people ride over our heads. We went through fire and water, but you brought us to a place of abundance. Can you imagine God letting people ride over the heads of those who trust Him? Can you imagine God promising you a peaceful future and then sending you into the fire and into the waters of life? However, all of these are pathways to greater things. They are pathways to abundance. Your tears are not wasted, my friend. Your prayers are not lost. God has not forgotten you. His words are true. And I have just shown you examples and testimonies of that truth. Let your faith come alive. Gather yourself back together and trust God's plan. There is a bigger picture. And in that picture, you are 10 times better, 10 times stronger, and 10 times wiser than this. Maybe you're asking, I believe, but I don't know how to trust God through my pain. The answer is found in his word. They that wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary, and they shall walk and not faint. Isaiah 40, verse 31. The answer is to wait on the Lord. That is how you trust him with your pain. Don't be hasty about seeking relief and comfort. Sometimes those are traps by the enemy to compromise you. Compromise is a thief of the Christian's reward. It makes you lose things you worked for and earned over time, only to give up on them at the last minute. Rather, stay with God's promise to you. Do not stop praying. Do not stop praising God. God is always watching us to see how we handle our pain. And praise in the midst of pain is one of the greatest ways to show faith and trust in God. Praise takes our attention off of the pain and trouble, and praise focuses us on the integrity and faithfulness of God, who is able to change things. Do not stop sharing your faith and standing for Jesus. Don't stop reading the Bible every day. Don't stop meditating on God's promises to you. Don't stop serving in your local church and supporting others in their own process. As you continue in these things despite your own challenges and pain, God will begin to work something inside of you. Over time, that work will reveal itself, thereby making you a living, walking testimony of God's faithfulness, just like Job in the Bible. I pray that God will clothe you with His peace this season and strengthen your weary heart to keep trusting and holding on to Him until His great plan is fulfilled in your life. As followers of Christ, every single event in our lives leads up to one thing. We believe, we pray, and we share the gospel of God so that when we meet Him, He may be pleased with us. Eternal life is our end game. We follow the will of God, using Jesus as our example, to claim a spot in His kingdom when the time comes. But aside from meeting our Creator in the afterlife, we know that the time will come for the Lord to personally visit and make Himself known to every living creature. God has shown Himself completely in His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, but God, the one and only, who is at the Father's side, has made Him known. As narrated in John 1.18, 
we are preparing so that when he comes down and judges us all, Jesus will be pleased with the spiritual lives we have led. He will also be here to see and hear us proclaim the glory and honor he deserves. Imagine if Jesus visited us right at this moment. Do you think he would be proud of who you currently are? I am sure there will be varying answers, but one thing I am sure of is this. We are works in progress. God is continuously helping us to be Christ-like because he will one day personally see his masterpieces. In Revelation chapter 2, he specifically told the nation who practiced his word to hold on to what they have until he comes. In the same way, we are holding on to our faith and sit in delight as we await the Lord. The only question to ask is this, how do we know if Jesus' visitation is nearing? Here are signs that you need to look for, for they mean that his second coming is near. The first sign covers the destruction of the earth and all its inhabitants. Manifestations of this include wars, famines, natural disasters, and widespread diseases. Matthew 27, 7 says, Nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. This represents a series of wars that is more chaotic and damaging than those previously in history. Today, there are ongoing civil wars and armed conflicts, such as in the nations of Afghanistan, Syria, and Ethiopia. Let us collectively say a prayer for our brothers and sisters in all involved nations. The Bible prophesied that there will be a global food shortage, calamities, and pandemics as well. Jesus describes the earthquakes to occur one after another, while the book of Luke mentions pestilence or horrendous diseases. These massive disturbances will bring tremendous pain and loss of life around the world. Up next, we have signs that are seen in people and their behavior. The first one is wicked attitudes. This refers to morals that have deteriorated more than the usual share of evil. On a regular day, the chance of having a bad encounter with people is low. It's not every day that you can experience someone cutting in line, bumping you without a proper apology, or snubbing you outright. However, in the last days, you'll notice that there may be more bad apples than good ones. Matthew 24.10 says, And then many will be offended, will betray one another, and will hate one another. There will be more hate circulating. Principles are more corrupt. And the worst thing is that they won't even feel ashamed for that. Even now, the devil is always planting people and things that help propagate wickedness. But when the day of revelation is near, hatred will become the new normal. The next thing to watch out for is dysfunction in the family. The family is the basic unit of the community. Found in the book of Psalms, look at how good and pleasing it is when families live together as one. At a time where wickedness prevails, it will undoubtedly affect our inner circles, starting with our family. In the book of Timothy, it predicts that there will come a time where there is no natural affection for one's family members, and disobedience will rule the hearts of children. We know that one's relationship with their family reflects one's character. So, if the majority of people live with a dysfunctional family, what does that tell us about the gravity of this sign? 1 John 4.20 tells us, Whoever claims to love God, yet hates a brother or sister, is a liar. For whoever does not love their brother and sister, whom they have seen, cannot love God, whom they have not seen. This brings me to the next point. Devotion to God will decline. When we cannot even fully love our family, the people that God has appointed to be with us for the rest of our lives, it says a lot about our relationship with God. The book of Timothy illustrates this. People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of the good, treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure 
rather than lovers of God. Narcissism will be at its peak in the end days. Can you imagine dealing with these types of people? It sounds so harsh in the scripture, but these traits are commonly exhibited by people today. The most important way of glorifying God is by following His word and striving to be godly. This sign is the exact opposite. Be careful and take note when you meet people with this character. It is not too late to share the word of the Lord. Because of people's lack of direction, Matthew 24.12 says that the love of the greater number will grow cold. On the bright side, another sign is that an enhanced grasp of the Bible in general will take place. Are you familiar with the saying, to see is to believe? Well, as we near the end, both non-believers and believers will see how the prophecies will unfold exactly the way they were told in the Bible. Once even the non-believers realize that God's word is timelessly accurate and genuine, they will start learning more about God. As for Christians, we will connect with the Bible more than ever Experts will delve into the text in order to draw information from it regarding the state of humanity. They will have to rely on prophecies to prepare for what is to come. This will catalyze the next sign, a stronger preaching movement. In Matthew 24, 14, it is written, And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations, and then the end will come. People will want to cling to the gospel after seeing that God is indeed real. Christianity will become more alive than ever. However, a state of panic will garner different responses from the public. Some will run to the truth, and some will seek comfort from different sources. The unfortunate aspect is that evangelists who teach lessons that are not in line with the Bible have the ability to provide ingenuine consolation to people. Another sign is the growing number of fake evangelists and believers. Jesus asked John the Apostle to send seven letters to the churches in Asia. Each letter declares the recipient church's achievements and failures and warns each congregation to repent. He particularly despised false preachers, but the number of these will arise soon. In Revelation 2.20, Christ tells one of the churches, Nevertheless, I have this against you. You tolerate that woman, Jezebel, who calls herself a prophet. By her teaching, she misled my servants into sexual immorality and the eating of food sacrificed to idols. Along with this is widespread mockery. The end of the world calls for persecution of Christians and our faith. Matthew 24, 9 says, Then they will deliver you up to tribulation and kill you, and you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. They will argue about why God would allow the world to end, and use this as an opportunity to attack Christ's followers. The truth is that God has been reaching out to each and every one of us. Salvation is not an exclusive thing. We are all called on to serve Him. And for us who have accepted the invitation to live in His ways, we have known since the beginning about His greatness and prophecies. Faith cannot be selective. One cannot claim to be a Christian, but only love God's favor in their life. We have accepted that He will return to earth one day, and His return will put an end to our misdeeds. Admit it or not, we can get worried about the thought of the end of the world. We think about our lives, loved ones, the goals we still wish to achieve, the things we have yet to do, and more. We focus on the fact that we have not maximized our lives yet. If you truly learn from God, you will know that not only will our world end, it will also give way to a new one. In Revelation 21, Jesus tells John, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty, I will give water without cost from the spring of the water of life. Those who are victorious will inherit all this, and I will be their God, and they will be my children. 
John's vision states that Jesus will dwell in our land. Yes, the begotten Son will live with us. We look forward to those last days as we know that what is about to come will be unimaginably better than what we have now. We must take note that as long as you are doing your best to obey God's instructions, you are safe from His judgment. Some believe that we are already living in the last days. What do you think of that idea? Nevertheless, repent regularly and seek His righteousness in all that you do. The day of the Lord is near, and let us look forward to it with excitement.